Welcome to On the Ballot with Ballotpedia, where we take a closer look at the week's top political stories. Ballotpedia connects people to politics by providing neutral, nonpartisan, and reliable information on our government, how it works, and where it's headed. We're here to give you the facts so you can form your own opinion. I'm Victoria Rose, and thanks for being with us. Today, we're catching up on the latest election-related legislative action and trends we've seen emerge thus far this year with staff writer Joseph Greeny. Hey, Joe. Welcome to the show. Hey, Victoria. Glad to be here. Yeah, it's your first time on the show. And as a first-timer, we always start by asking our guests how they ended up at Ballopedia. So what's your origin story? Great question. I've been using Ballopedia for, it's crazy to say it out loud, but going on a decade now. I started using the site back in college as a political science major. And again, I don't want to think about how long ago that actually was. Continued to use the site. It's just such an awesome resource through sort of my first couple of years in the professional world. I'm working in the nonprofit democracy space. Had an opportunity to come on as a contract worker, helping out with some research and some on-site stuff a little over a year ago, and then made it full-time just about two months ago. And it's been an awesome experience so far. And you're on the elections team, right? So I'm on the marquee law team, actually. So your day-to-day looks like updating the election administration legislation tracker, that big mouthful of words. Oh, yeah. And there's always something fun. Pop. There's a lot of tech on the backside of that as well, which you know is well above my head. But there's always some fun stuff popping up. We're playing whack-a-mole, making sure everything's up to date. But yeah, really keeping up to date with uh, election admin updates across the country, whether it be through state executive action or state legislative action, which we're going to dive a little bit into today. It's a really dynamic space. There's always stuff going on. And especially as as I'm sure listeners of the podcast know, and you know, Victoria, over the last couple of years, there's just been more and more attention across the country paid to election administration. So always something fun to, to look at and to talk about. Yeah. So let's dive right into it. Before we get too into the weeds, I think we should start first with giving our listeners a sense of the big picture. Which states are introducing the most election related legislation this year? So this year, we've got one leader who's way out in front of the pack, which is Texas, who's introduced 387 bills as of today, May 3rd, so far this year in 2023. That's nearly 100 more. It's about 90 more than the number two state, which is New York, with 301 bills. Both of those states, again, are way out in front of the pack um, and leading over a handful of other states in the sort of 100 to 200 range, including New Jersey, Illinois, and Minnesota. Quick comparison to 2022, New York was also a leader in terms of election-related legislation introduced last year with over 400 bills, followed by by Illinois, Michigan, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, and then Tennessee, which was the first Republican-led state in terms of bill introduction last year. Just one thing on the number of Texas bills as well. Part of that is due to sort of idiosyncratic nature of Texas's legislative calendar. They actually were not in session last year. So a lot of the stuff that may have been spread out over multiple sessions has been introduced just this year. Yeah, I was going to ask if you had any inclination as to why that number would be so high in Texas and New York. That makes sense. Yeah, they only meet in odd-numbered years. New York is always doing stuff as well. They just sort of remain incredibly active in this space. And I think we'll get into this as well. But again, bill introduction does, doesn't necessarily mean things are actually being enacted or, or changed. So Right. It needs to be introduced and then passed and then obviously given the green light by the governor. So which states have the highest enactment rates this year? So let's just look at Texas. Uh, This is a bit of a counterexample. We just mentioned they've introduced 387 bills so far this year, but not a single one has been enacted. And again, some of this is due to the particularities of, of how legislative sessions work. Some sessions are already over right now. Some 2023 sessions are already concluded. Some are sort of just getting ramped up. But yeah, uh, other states that are out in front in terms of bill enactment this year are actually Republican-led states. Arkansas has enacted the highest percent of election-related legislation that's been introduced this year with 55% of introduced legislation later enacted, followed by South Dakota with 42% and Utah with 41%. And again, we've got a handful of states that are still sitting on zero, um, and I'm sure that'll change over the next couple of months. So those states with the highest enactment rates are all Republican trifectas, like you said. And as just a quick reminder for our listeners, a trifecta means one party controls both the state house and Senate and also occupies the governorship. The opposite of this is divided government, meaning that neither party controls all branches of government. So it looks like Republican trifectas are enacting a higher rate of election legislation bill specifically. Can you tell us like why that may be? Yeah, well, it's not a it's not a coincidence that states where one party controls both chambers of the legislature and the governorship are enacting bills at a higher rate when you have sort of control of the entire pipeline of 
legislation, then you're going to be able to move your priorities a little bit quicker. And again, this year, we've seen three Republican trifecta states out in front enacting the highest percent of legislation introduced. This is a bit different than last year, actually, where we saw Democratic trifecta states out in front. This year, Maryland is leading Democratic trifecta states this year with 8.1% of election-related legislation introduced, later enacted. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it is really the best way to just sort of describe the mechanism that's going on with those bills. Again, Maryland is the leader amongst Democratic trifectas with 8.1%. That's compared to Arkansas on the Republican side with 55% and a handful of other Republican trifecta states that are well out in front of all the other Democratic states. And how does that compare to 2022 data? It's a bit of a departure from 2022. We saw Democratic trifecta states actually out in front in terms of uh, enactment rate. Um, Colorado and Connecticut were among the top three, both Democratic trifecta states. And they were actually joined by Utah last year, so a Republican trifecta state that's been amongst the top three in bill enactment rate both years. And then also last year, just in terms of raw numbers of bills enacted, two Democratic trifecta states were out in front, and these were New York and California. And again, just diving into top line numbers so far this year, we've got 22 states with Republican trifectas right now. 12 have enacted election legislation. And we've got 17 states with Democratic trifectas and only seven have enacted any legislation. So yeah, we are seeing the Republican trifecta states prioritizing moving election legislation so far this year, a little bit different than last year. On the flip side with divided government, those states are moving legislation at a slower rate. What's the story there? Yeah, divided government doesn't necessarily mean that a uh, state can't pass any legislation, but uh, to your point, it's obviously a little bit harder for folks to, to come together in a divided government state and sort of settle on priorities and decide to, to move some legislation. But yeah, we, we have seen some divided government states enacting legislation so far this year, but at a slower rate than last year to up to this point in the year. So last year, before state legislative elections, we had 13 states with divided government. 12 of those states enacted some sort of election legislation during the year. This year, we've only got 11 states with divided government, and just five of those 11 have enacted any election-related legislation so far this year. Again, we mentioned this earlier in our conversation, but part of this is, is going to come down to legislative calendars. And I do expect that this number will get a bit closer to last year's number and we'll have a fairly similar rate uh, of divided government states passing legislation by the end of the year. And what sort of election-related policy have divided governments actually been able to pass? Like you said, at the top of our conversation, election policy can be pretty divisive. So I'm interested to hear what legislatures are coming to a consensus on. Yeah, totally. It's a fascinating thing to to look at. So of bills in states with divided government that have been enacted so far this year, we're actually seeing uh, lawmakers focus on what we refer to as contest-specific procedures, which are basically changes to specific elections in that particular state. An example of this is changing uh, municipal election procedures. And this has been the most common bill topic enacted in divided government states so far this year. And it kind of suggests that an area for of opportunity for lawmakers to come to agreement, basically providing oversight to local elections or election procedures within their states. And just an example of such a bill that's passed this year is can be found in North Carolina, uh, House Bill 88. It's a bill that modifies procedures for local elections, including to make several local boards of education, procedures for filling vacancies, and a couple other things. Again, this bill is a bill that modifies elections in specific jurisdictions within the state. So it's not changing election procedures statewide. It's just changing election procedures for specific jurisdictions. And yeah, it's interesting to see that it seems at least that lawmakers can come to agreement about changes that are needed at that local level for specific jurisdictions um, or yeah, for specific contests within their states. And then I just want to highlight as well, just let's go back one year and look at 2022 and what divided governments were doing in 2022, because there's actually a couple interesting trends there. The most common topic of enacted election legislation in 2022 was the private funding of elections, with nine bills total enacted in divided government states last year. That's really interesting because private funding is an issue that ostensibly is pretty partisan. Just to give listeners uh, a bit more information on what this sort of refers to, the private funding of elections refers to the use of private resources, donations, nonprofit grants, anything of that. That sort for public election administration. We saw a wave of states beginning in 2021 begin to consider and enact legislation that prohibited, limited, or otherwise regulated the use of private resources for election administration costs. 
a lot of this action was in response to a series of donations around the 2020 election, the most notable of which were made by Mark Zuckerberg and his wife, Priscilla Chan, who made donations to a number of nonprofits in the lead up to the 2020 general election for the purposes of election administration. We saw a number of elected officials, particularly Republicans, object to the use of private monies for election administration, again, beginning in 2021 sessions after the 2020 election. And while Republican states led the charge here with 21 of 28 states where the GOP controls both chambers of the legislature, and that's that's right now, those numbers are current of right now, 2023. So 21 of those 28 states have enacted some sort of regulation. But we saw four divided government states all last year enact some sort of limitation or restriction on private funding. It's just a bit of a counter trend example on an issue that, again, ostensibly is fairly partisan, has been a Republican priority. But we have seen divided government states move and enact similar legislation as well. And then I should just mention as well, of the 24 states right now that do have private funding restrictions or bans, 17 of the enacting bills, so 17 of the 24, did receive some Democratic support while in the legislature. And I think that that gives you a little view that this might not be as partisan of an issue as the headlines are telling us. And even though no states with Democratic trifectas and no states where Democrats control both chambers of the legislature have enacted this type of legislation, we are seeing some Democrats get on board there. What were those four states that had divided governments that did enact legislation keeping private funding from elections? Yep. Those states were Kansas, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. In Kansas, that bill was enacted through a veto override. So Governor Kelly originally vetoed this bill after approval. The veto was overridden last year. Virginia, uh, Republican Governor Glenn Youngkin signed that bill. There is a divided legislature in that state, though. Pennsylvania at the time, then Democratic Governor Tom Wolf did sign this legislation once it was passed through the legislature. And then in Kentucky, that bill was enacted without the signature of Democratic Governor Andy Bashir. So we see kind of a, an interesting mix here of how lawmakers on both sides of the aisle and governors on both sides of the aisle are sort of approaching and reacting to private funding bans. And then just one more thing to mention there. So we mentioned earlier that 21 of the 28 states where the GOP controls both chambers of the legislature have enacted some sort of legislation related to private funding restrictions. So we've got seven holdouts there. Right now, there are active bills in three of those holdout states, North Carolina, Montana, and Louisiana, which would enact a ban or restriction on private funding in those states. Louisiana's bill is actually a proposal to create a ballot question around this. So it would end up going to the voters of that state to determine whether or not a, a ban should be implemented. Um, and then one one of the other states, Wisconsin, they passed a first consideration of a, of a constitutional amendment, which would ban the use of private funding in, 2020, in the 2021 legislative session. How constitutional amendments work in Wisconsin, I'm sure a lot of our, our listeners are aware, but it requires adoption by the legislature in two consecutive sessions. And then it would need to be ratified by the electorate of the state afterwards. So this amendment would be up for a second consideration in the legislature this year. No such resolution for a second consideration has been introduced yet, but I do expect um, that will be introduced in the Wisconsin legislature sometime this year. You mentioned a bit ago about governors vetoing election-related legislation. So I'm curious, what are we seeing in terms of what's being vetoed? What types of policies are being vetoed? Yeah, great question. And always super interesting to dive into vetoed bills. Um, sometimes they can tell us a lot. Sometimes they don't tell us anything. Um, I think some of the, the vetoes this year are pretty interesting. We've seen four election-related bills vetoed so far this year. Two of those are in Arizona, one in North Dakota, one in Wyoming. So that's two uh, in divided government states, both Arizona vetoes, and then two in Republican trifecta states. I actually think the most interesting highlight here, and it's likely a good segue into a, a, a next topic for us, is two bans on ranked choice voting were vetoed this year, one in Arizona, one in North Dakota. North Dakota, it was House Bill 1273, which would, pre- would have prohibited the use of ranked choice voting and approval voting in that state. Passed through both chambers of the legislature, was eventually vetoed by Republican Governor Doug Burgum, and a veto override of that bill actually failed. In Arizona, we saw HB 2552, which was also a ban on the use of ranked choice voting in that state, vetoed by Democratic Governor Katie Hobbs. Again, Arizona is a state where the Republicans control both chambers of the legislature, but with a Democratic governor. The other bill in Arizona, 
that was vetoed was a an affirmation of the state legislature's support for the importance of the Electoral College. Interesting to see Republicans affirming support for the Electoral College, Democratic governor vetoing that affirmation. And then in Wyoming, we saw a veto of a bill that would have prohibited the unsolicited distribution of absentee ballot request forms in that state. I'm sure we're going to see some more bills vetoed before the end of sessions this year. But even in those four, I think there's some uh, some interesting stuff. Yeah, let's get into that ranked choice voting because it's definitely a topic both with election legislation and then also in my space of ballot measures. So I'm interested in what sort of policies involving ranked choice voting are being proposed. Yeah, well, the big one that sticks out is a lot more state legislators are considering bans or prohibitions on the use of ranked choice voting this session over last session. In total, the number of bills related to ranked choice voting year on year is fairly similar. But yeah, we're seeing a lot more lawmakers consider or introduce legislation that would prohibit the use of ranked choice voting, restrict, even outright ban it. A lot of these bills are focused specifically on ranked choice voting, but a lot of them uh, include sort of other mechanisms, approval voting, tabulated voting, things along those lines. And then to dive into the states that have actually enacted legislation. So Florida and Tennessee were the first two states to ban or prohibit the use of ranked choice voting statewide. Both states did did so through legislation last year in 2022. We've seen two states join them so far this year, South Dakota and Idaho. And then again, as we were just discussing, two other states have two other state legislatures have passed these bills through the legislature only to have them vetoed by the governor. I think it is interesting as well to, uh, or it's worth highlighting that despite this uptick in attempts to ban or restrict the use of ranked choice voting, the vast majority of uh, of bills of state legislation related to ranked choice voting is still related to either a new authorization of ranked choice voting in a particular state, either for local elections, statewide elections, a combination thereof, or are modifications to existing ranked choice voting uses. So again, we're seeing this uptick in states that are attempting to limit or restrict the use of ranked choice voting, but the vast majority of bills are still authorizations or modifications to existing programs. Got it. And Alaska and Maine are the only ones right now with state level ranked choice voting implemented. Is that correct? Correct. For statewide elections. And actually, both of these states have legislation that's been introduced this session that would repeal their state's use, uh, statewide use, that is, of ranked choice voting. Both of these repeal efforts in Alaska and Maine are respond- are excuse me, are sponsored by Republicans. And that's a good reminder for me as well that just to mention, most of these bills prohibiting ranked choice voting are being spearheaded by Republican lawmakers. We're really seeing more of a pushback to changes to voting methods come from the right, at least in state legislatures, than we are from Democratic lawmakers. Got it. And are there any other notable topics you want to address as far as election policy being proposed in legislatures? Um, yeah, there's. We touched on private funding, which I think is really interesting. Again, we're seeing we're continuing to see states uh, consider regulations around the private funding of elections. Another one that sticks out is changes in election dates. We're also seeing a lot of states uh, look at modifications to absentee voting processes, um, as well as voter ID requirements. Um, I think voter ID is is been a pretty popular topic over the last couple of sessions. I was looking at some of our data. We've seen a nearly 50% increase in legislation introduced that pertains to the consolidation of election dates, which we actually covered in our podcast a couple of weeks ago, uh, with more states eyeing school board election changes. So we've talked about school boards a lot on the show. What specific changes do state legislatures have in mind as far as election dates and school boards? Yeah, you you kind of just hit on it. it. Mostly states are considering consolidating election dates, which means getting rid of either off cycle or off date elections. And let's break down what that means a little bit more. So off cycle refers to elections that are taking place in off years. So if a state holds most or all of their statewide elections in an even year, and then let's say for use of an example, they hold they hold school board elections in odd years. We're seeing more states try and eliminate those off-cycle, odd-year elections and consolidate them with even-year elections. Uh, and then off-date elections, same kind of idea, but within an even year. Or again, some states do are sticking to the odd-year calendars and are consolidating excuse me, consolidating dates within an odd year. But mostly, yeah, we're seeing states move to to limit or um, 
just bring down the total number of election days per year and consolidate elections into into one date. So, so far this year, we've seen 11 states consider bills related to modifying school board election dates specifically. Most of these modifications, again, are consolidations with other statewide election dates. And this 11 states this year is up from two last year. So again, that's a big uptick in the number of states that are looking to consolidate school board elections in particular. Um, And then yeah, just on the partisanship piece there, again, Republicans are the main sponsors of almost all of these bills. Although election date consolidation is an issue that seems to receive uh, pretty equal support across the, the partisan spectrum. That's interesting. And then finally, I have a question about omnibus bills or big package type bills that may have been enacted this year worth going into some detail about. I know when we talked earlier, you kind of mentioned Ohio and New Mexico. So I'd love to start with those two states. Yeah, these are Ohio and New Mexico have definitely sort of set themselves apart. And so far this year, by enacting these big omnibus election administration packages, In Ohio, we have House Bill 458, which among, again, many things that this bill did, it implemented a new photo ID requirement. Previously in the state, there was an ID requirement, but it was a non-photo ID requirement for voting. It also changed absentee deadlines and early voting timelines in the state, and it did quite a bit more. And again, we've seen election administration be a sort of top line, front of mind topic in Ohio over the last couple of years. Uh, Note for our listeners, Ohio is a Republican trifecta. So yeah, um, thank you. And then New Mexico on the other side of the political spectrum this year has enacted House Bill 4 which proponents of the bill have labeled this the New Mexico Voting Rights Act. And just a a, a quick sidebar on that, we've seen a lot of states this year introducing these bills with similar titles, these omnibus packages that are either titled sort of State Voting Rights Act or from the other side of the spectrum. Again, a lot of those Voting Rights Act packages are Democratic introduced, not exclusively, but most of that's sort of the nomenclature that Democratic lawmakers are bringing to these big election packages. Then the other side of the aisle, we're seeing Election Integrity Acts also introduced in a lot of states, which are similarly these large omnibus election administration packages. And that election integrity nomenclature is, again, sort of how Republicans are are trying to um, frame their proposed changes to election administration in their states. And again, that's not a, a hard and fast rule, but it's just a trend that we've seen. And I think it's interesting to, again, to look at the sort of nomenclature, the names that lawmakers are applying to these big packages. And then return back to what's gone on in New Mexico this year. So HB4, the New Mexico Voting Rights Act, established automatic voter registration in New Mexico, implemented automatic restoration of voting rights for people convicted of a felony once they complete a a prison sentence or any uh, mandated prison sentence. And it also designated election day as a school holiday. And again, similar to the Ohio omnibus bill, that we just mentioned. This bill does a whole lot more. These are just some highlights that we're pulling out. And then one other bill that I think is interesting to to keep an eye on and looks like it will be headed to the governor's desk in that state state soon is Florida's Senate Bill 7050. I think this this is, again, a huge bill. Could probably be a whole podcast on its own. And maybe when it gets enacted, that'll be a a future episode. I'll leave that to you, Victoria. But some of the things that this bill does, again, Florida's really brought a focus on trying to crack down on instances of election fraud in the state. It's been a priority of Governor Ron DeSantis to present a strong front against alleged election fraud um, in the state. So again, this is a large omnibus bill that does quite a lot, but a lot of what it's doing is related to uh, increasing penalties for fraud, expanding the authority of the recently created Office of Election Crimes and Security in that state. And then just one really interesting thing that got snuck into this bill through an amendment is this bill actually also addresses Florida's existing resign to run law, which could have implications for Governor DeSantis' speculated run for the Republican nomination in 2024. There's a bit of legal back and forth about whether or not um, he would be precluded from declaring candidacy while still governor of Florida. But this bill would sort of nip that in the bud and and get rid of any sort of doubt about his eligibility to declare candidacy while governor. Interesting. Well, like you said, this will maybe have you back to discuss the enactment of of this bill if it gets enacted. For now, that's all the questions I have for you. Thank you so much for coming on and unpacking all the action taking place at the state legislative level. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, I really appreciate it, Victoria. There's, uh, I feel like we covered a, a whole lot and there's a ton more going on as well. Encourage podcast listeners to dive into our on-site resources. We're keeping track of all of these changes um, in real time. Also check out our legislation tracker 
Um, it's a labor of love. Shout out to my colleagues, Ethan, Janie, and the rest of our team who do a great job uh, keeping that up to date and making sure it's a great resource for the public. Yeah, for sure. And it's linked in our show notes. So listeners, check it out. And that's all for this week's episode of On the Ballot. Make sure you don't miss an episode by subscribing and do us a solid by dropping a review of On the Ballot wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be back next week with another episode. And until then, if you have any questions, comments, or love for Ballotpedia, feel free to send it to us at on the ballot at ballotpedia.org or on Twitter at Ballotpedia. I'm Victoria Rose, and thanks for listening. Thank you.